There is a lot going on with Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, from planned updates to improve the game, developer commentary on the benefits to developing solely for the PlayStation 5, Rebirth sales figures, an update to the third game in the Final Fantasy VII Remake saga, and more. So let's waste no more time and get straight into the good stuff. Just be sure to participate in my deluxe edition giveaway of Shin Megami Tensei 5 Vengeance for another meaty RPG to sink your teeth into in a few months. You can access that with the link in the description. We're over a week into the release of Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, and while I can report that I'm having a great time with it and hold it as one of my favorite Final Fantasies ever, I want to hear from all you good people how you're enjoying the game so far. Don't worry about spoilers here in this video. Absolutely no spoilers going ahead, as we aren't going to be diving into any of the story content of the game here in Rebirth, but rather what's to come for Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, with some interviews that shed more light into the design process of the game, while also getting concrete information about the third game and what Square Enix hopes to accomplish with that title. Starting off, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth has had a mixed reception from players who have played the game in performance mode, a mode that seeks to achieve 60 frames per second by utilizing a dynamic resolution. Just like with the demo before the game launched, Square has addressed this criticism by acknowledging that many of the game's textures look watered down and quite underwhelming while playing the game in performance mode, and have noted that an upcoming patch will boost the visual quality of the mode while assuring there would be no hit to the frame rate. While Speaking to media outlet One More Game, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth director Naoki Hamaguchi stated that the game received most of its player feedback regarding the graphics in performance mode, and addressed these issues with the following. We've received a lot of feedback on whether the graphics in the performance mode will be improved or not. We hear you, and we are currently working on an update patch to improve that aspect. I don't think the release date would be far away from now. Hamaguchi continues with, We have heard from players that in certain situations, the facial lighting makes some character shadows look very scary, so that's one part of the update that we are working on. So, what we can glean from these statements is that a patch is in development and should be releasing soon, which will tackle various graphical issues in performance mode, including some facial lighting improvements on characters among the list of anticipated changes. Now, I've been playing through the game on performance mode, and while the game certainly sports some muddy textures here and there, I haven't run into anything that looks quite as bad and jarring as the infamous door that everyone was talking about when Final Fantasy VII Remake launched. But yeah, when compared to the game's graphics mode that capped at 30 FPS, the performance mode is definitely hit with drastic clarity and detail reduction. That said, what are your thoughts on the game's performance mode, and do you find the quality of that mode to be less than desired? Let me know in the comments! When talking about the game's graphical fidelity, Rebirth's scale and much more massive world over the previous Final Fantasy VII Remake comes into question, as there is absolutely no denying that Rebirth's sheer size does play a role on achieving visual consistency throughout the game. In a story by Gene Park of the Washington Post, he addresses Final Fantasy producer and original director of Final Fantasy VII, Yoshinori Kitase's remarks about the benefits of solely developing Rebirth for one system. Had it not been on a single platform, the world map would not be seamless, and the game design would have to regress significantly, Kitase stated. Kitase would later state that developing the game exclusively for the PS5 made it easier for the team to focus on building a world populated with NPCs that spans across numerous indoor and outdoor locations set within a world that sports diverse landscapes and geography, all while containing no loading screen interruptions. This makes sense, right? That if Final Fantasy VII Rebirth were also intended to be on the PS4, that aspects of the game's cohesive vision, as outlined by Kitase, would likely have been compromised. Not saying that a PS4 version of Rebirth couldn't be possible, but it goes to show that the game development process is much simpler when developers are solely focused on creating a game for a singular platform to really get the game right, and then later on, as we've seen, the game can then be ported to PC or other platforms down the line. Now, developing a game solely for the PS5 does have its risks, as this certainly does limit the game's exposure to fans by having it solely tied to a platform for several months to a year. And we are getting that sort of indication about platform exclusivity with the sales numbers so far for Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. Just note that these numbers are solely tied to the game's physical release in Japan, as Rebirth managed to sell around 263,000 physical copies in Japan in its first week. Now, comparing this to Final 
Final Fantasy VII Remake's more than 700,000 units sold in the first week isn't the best comparison, simply because that game initially released on the PS4 that had nearly twice the amount of PS4s out at the time of that game's release. Plus, the game came out at the peak of the pandemic. What we can better benchmark Rebirth sales figures to is Final Fantasy XVI sales in Japan, which, interestingly, saw Final Fantasy XVI sell 73,000 more copies than Rebirth on launch. With that said, we still have no idea about the sales figures for the game outside of Japan, but seeing as the game has been available for over a week now and with no official report from Square, it may be that they are disappointed in the sales of this game. This is just speculation for now, and I will be sure to update you all about the worldwide sales as we hear about it. That said, Sony and Square have had a long-lasting relationship for nearly two decades, and Christian Svensson, the vice president of second and third-party content ventures at Sony Interactive Entertainment, remarks that Square is ingrained in our DNA to this day, and connects directly to how we've worked together on Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. Svensson later went on to say that console exclusivity was mutually desired when the Final Fantasy VII Remake project was brought to life, so it is very likely that Part 3 of the Remake series will debut exclusively for Sony's consoles. With a PC release likely happening within a year, there is no doubt that the sales figures for the remake saga will continue to grow, but there's also no denying that Square and Sony have had a long connection from the start, and that these games are being developed in mind specifically for Sony's platforms before being ported elsewhere. Regardless of how well the game is selling as of now, Square Enix is working full throttle on the finale to the Final Fantasy VII Remake Saga, as Square has outlined some specific things that they would like to nail in the third game to wrap up the trilogy. In the same interview with Gene Park of the Washington Post, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth director Naoki Hamaguchi detailed the aspect he'd like to get right for the third part of the trilogy. Hamaguchi remarked that the team was very satisfied with how the original game's world map was implemented into Rebirth, with the seamless traversal of the game's regions and content offered within being among the team's greatest accomplishments. When discussing his hopes for the third game, Hamaguchi stated, I definitely want to address the same for what is likely expected from our experience with the high wind to explore the world. The High Wind, being the airship that players could helm starting in Disc 2 of the PS1 original, made it so that players could travel the entire expanse of Gaia, making it possible for players to reach new locations while also allowing players to revisit almost every location previously accessible. The High Wind and the complete traversal of the world map was definitely a huge component that made Final Fantasy VII feel so grand all those years ago, and translating this component into the third and final Final Fantasy VII remake game is likely at the forefront of things that Hamaguchi and his team are trying to get right here. Hamaguchi explained that much of the work for the third game has already been done, thanks in large part to the world construction for the pre-existing areas already being finished from Rebirth. Much of the key elements from both a narrative and gameplay standpoint have also been drafted for the third game, so Final Fantasy VII Remake Part 3 is already well underway, and while that game is still years off, it's definitely reassuring knowing that so much of the work for Part 3 has been done since Rebirth established the foundation for the world map design. With that said, what are you most looking forward to in the third game of the remake series? Be sure to stay tuned to the channel for more updates to Final Fantasy and other JRPG content, and I will see all you good people real soon in the next one.